And I, you know, when, when things get really difficult and hard, it's really easy to have that kind of, the mentality that, you know, it's just not gonna get better. It's easy to get really down in, in down situations. But what I found that's helped me in really tough situations, in hard moments, which many of you right now may be going through, something I've learned to do is just think about how God has come through in other dark times in my life. He has. And it doesn't take much to think about those moments when God comes through for you. If you made it here tonight, if you're online right now, in a way God has come through. Maybe you should have been dead. Maybe you should have lost your mind. Maybe you should have been locked up for a long time. Maybe you shouldn't even be here tonight. We all know those moments. Maybe God spared your life in a car accident. Maybe God healed you from a sickness. Maybe God has given you some extra days today. God has done something for you and there's something we can be thankful for. You're still here. You know what that tells me? That tells me God is not done with you yet. He has a plan for you, son. He has a plan for you, daughter. I've messed up. I felt God one too many times. Well, here's the thing. If you think God doesn't want you anymore because you've messed up one too many times, then why are you still alive right now? Why are you here in church? Why are you listening online? You know what that tells me? God is not done chasing after you with his love and his grace. He wants to forgive you. He wants to set you free. He wants to give you a new beginning. Come on, there's something to be thankful for to God tonight. If you're in this room, God loves you. He has a plan for you. So I just want to encourage you, don't give up. Don't lose hope. He's not done with you yet. He comes through time and time again and he's good all the time how many know that to be true tonight well let's we're gonna jump into a word tonight but before we do why don't we pray bow your heads with me father we thank you tonight is about you tonight is not about me about one single person in this room Jesus if there's one main character in this room it's you you're everything we need. You're the hope we need. You're the healing we need. You're the answer to our marital problems. You're the resource to, our, uh, to all of the needs we have in life. You're everything. Jesus, you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. God, I just pray that when we listen to your word tonight, that we would hear from you, that your word would come to life, that your word would change our hearts, and your word would fix our thoughts. Lord, sometimes we thought our thoughts have gone astray, but God, tonight, fix our thoughts on you. Remind us about how good you are. In Jesus' name, we all say amen and amen. Can we give Jesus one shot of praise before we sit down? Go ahead and take a seat. Give your neighbor a high five. Tell them, I'm excited to see you in church tonight. Well, I'm really grateful that you guys are here in church tonight. Welcome to church. How many love your church? You just love your church. I love my church. I love my pastor, Pastor Marco. I'm not sure if he's watching tonight, but can we give our pastor a big round of applause? The best pastor in the world. He just got done speaking at a summit for pastors and for um, a summit, a conference for pastors actually at Pastor Vlad Savchuk's church. Pastor Vlad invited Pastor Marco to speak at his conference, and he just got done pouring into pastors. So one more time, a big round of applause for our leaders. They're amazing. Um, I am the, my name is Christian. I'm the campus pastor here at Hallmark Campus. And I actually grew up here in The Way. I grew up at The Way. Um, when I first started coming to the church, I was 14. I grew up uh, going to the campus off of 4th and Arrowhead, right across the street from the courthouse. And I came into the church very broken, very angry, very lost. My family, there was drugs in and out of my family. My dad died at a young age. 
uh, my older siblings. There, were, there was a lot of pain and turmoil and destruction in my home. And there was really only one person that could save us. His name is Jesus. And we came here broken, and God has really restored my life and my family. I met my wife here at The Way. She's sitting front row, front and center. She was up here on the mic earlier. Her name is Yesenia, my beautiful wife. And um, today we're going to be talking about a message. Enough about me. Let's talk about Jesus. We're going to talk about a message, and I want to actually let you guys know about how tonight got set up. So on Wednesday nights, typically we study, what we're going to study is our daily growth book passage of the week. Now these passages were assigned last year sometime. So there was no setup prior to this. We didn't think about this a month ago or two weeks ago and say, you know, it'd be great. Let's study this portion of scripture on this week and, um, and let's line it up with the series that we've been in. So if you haven't been here, we've been in a series on the end times. How many have been here on Sundays and Wednesdays this past month? We've been talking about the end times. And it just so happens that the way things are going in the world right now seem to point to that we are living in the last days. Ru uh, wars happening around the world, different uh, weather patterns and events, different things that are taking place. And it just so happens that tonight and these past few weeks that we've been studying as a church, verse by verse, Jesus talking about the end times. Church, I want you to know, we did not set this up to line up the way it has been lining up. If you think, wow, they did a good job, how'd they think of that? We didn't. We didn't think, we're not that smart. But God's fingerprints are all over what we're gonna hear tonight. God's fingerprints are all over what we've been talking about. So I want you to know that the message we're bringing tonight, it actually is not a continuation of the end time series. Our last message was on Sunday for the end times. But tonight just so happens to be an end times passage of scripture that was already pre-assigned that we'd be preaching on tonight. What am I saying? I'm saying pay attention because God is doing something. And when God aligns things up like this, we have to listen and we have to really d lean in. Someone say lean in. We gotta lean in because God wants to tell us something tonight. How many are ready? Great, I'm glad you're ready. One more, one more time, but show of hands. How many are ready tonight? How many are ready? Great. I'm glad you're ready because the title of tonight's message is Be Ready. Someone say, be ready. Yeah. We're going to study from the book of Matthew, chapter 24, starting from verses 42. We're going to go all the way to verse 51. It says, so you too must keep watch. Someone say, keep watch. For you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. Where are my fathers at in the place? Where are my husbands at? If you knew that someone was gonna come rob your house, are you gonna let somebody come into your house and touch your family and mess with your kids? No. Where are all the mamas at in here? Where are all the wives, mama bears? Same goes for you. If a burglar comes in and says, I'm gonna rob your house tonight at 10 o'clock, are you gonna let that happen? None of us would let this happen. None of us would, would let it happen. So the scripture is saying here, keep watch. If you knew what time a burglar was coming, you would not just let this happen. You would not permit them to come in. Verse 44 says, you also must be ready all the time. Someone say all the time. For the Son of Man will come when least expected. You know, that Jesus right now, he set up this entire chapter, chapter 24, and he's talking about the times when the end will come. He's referring to prophecy. He's actually prophesying of things that are still to come. And there's signs that will happen. There's things that we'll see. And a lot of that we covered this past month. But he comes to this point, and he actually is warning one more time. He's speaking to his disciples, 
And he's saying, you must be ready for this time that happens. First point for you tonight is this. Just this point, this principle. We don't know when. We don't know when. We don't know when what? We do not know when Jesus will return. We do not know. In a moment, it could happen. And what do I mean by his return? Well, there's going to be a moment where Jesus will come on the clouds. We will be actually taken up or raptured. I know that sounds crazy, but what that actually means is that believers everywhere all over the world will literally be snatched up into the air and we will be taken. We will go, into, we will go to be with the Lord and in a moment it will happen. And the scripture is actually talking about that time that will take place. And it's not gonna happen when everybody thinks it will. It's gonna happen, scripture's saying here, when it's least expected. It could happen in a church service. Could happen, maybe you're not married yet. It could happen at your wedding. How crazy would that be? How sad would it be? The groom is standing there and the bride's gone. That'd be messed up. He's like, what? It could happen at your graduation. It could happen at a baby shower. It could happen when you're at the club. Uh-oh. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk. I'm going to talk about your Friday night. I didn't mean to put you on blessing. I'm just kidding. I'll just play. It's a reality. It could happen anytime, any place, anywhere, but it's going to happen when we least expect it. But here's the thing. Here's the reality. Is that Jesus is clearly, clearly showing us that nobody knows when that time is going to happen. No one can predict this initial return when we're going to be snatched up, when we're going to be raptured. That word keep watch in the scripture comes from this Greek word, Grigoriete. I think I did that right. Hopefully I did. Means give, give strict attention to. It means, and no one, I'm sorry, it means this. To be cautious, to be active, it means to pay close attention to in order to avoid, through laziness, some destructive calamity suddenly overtaking you. What God is saying here is that we have to be so ready, so at attention, that we cannot afford to go to sleep at the wheel and, and, and face destruction because we decided to take a break from our walk with God. So, I know that many of you like going on vacations. Vacations are nice. How many like going on vacation? Even if it's a staycation, you just like staying home. Like, I'm going to take a day or two off. I get it. You work hard. Maybe you, des you deserve it. A day or two off. Call your boss tomorrow. Say, you know what? I'm just kidding. Don't do that. I'm just fine. Don't do that. You're going to come back to me and say, my pastor said it. Don't do that. Vacations are nice. Traveling is fun. And when you take vacation, all you're really saying is, I'm going to take a little break, a little breather, take some rest so that I can recharge and get back to work. But you know where we never take vacation from? We never take vacation from our faith. And what God is saying here is, some of us have gotten into this habit of taking a vacation from your faith and your walk with God. You think that it's okay to go through these cycles where you're on fire for God for three months and you take a little breather and you binge all your sin for a month straight and then you come back to the house of God. Who am I talking to? Listen, if you're here after your binge, that's okay. God wants you here. God invites you here. But what God is saying this, don't go back. Because all, the, all those things out here, it's going to leave you the same way you're feeling right now. Empty, destroyed, defeated, depressed. I love Bubba's testimony. Where's Bubba at? My boy Bubba right here. We grew up in church together. We actually grew up in the youth ministry together. We were serving the Lord together on fire for God. And, and I'm only going to say this because he already said it. He started living for himself. He started doing things the way he wanted to do. And the pleasures of this world and everything else in this world began to entice him and pull him and draw him away. So he took a break from God. But thank God that God loves us so much. That God loves Bubba so much. That even though we think 
that we are no good for God anymore. Even though we think that God doesn't love us, we can come home like the prodigal son and our father will welcome us back home with loving arms and restore all of his promises and his favor and his goodness to us. How many are thankful for this story like Bubba's? He's back in the house of God. God is good. So he'll do this. But we got to keep watch. We got to be cautious. We got we to gotta avoid being lazy in our walk with God and throwing in the towel when we want to. Why is this so important? First, because we do not want to be caught by surprise. Someone say, don't be caught by surprise. Jesus is coming at an hour we least expect. Don't wait for disaster to strike in order to get ready. How many of you have seen those commercials with the... Uh, you know, disaster awareness, just random commercials. You're watching your favorite show, and all of a sudden this commercial comes on like, just prepare for hurricanes in your area. You never know. Pack a bag, build a plan, and be informed. Have you ever seen those commercials or you seen those ads on social media where they tell you to plan and be ready? Sometimes I look at those and we might just roll our eyes thinking, what's the point of this? It's sunny outside. There's no problems today. I'm enjoying watching my show. I'm enjoying watching TV. And they're asking us to write a plan, to get ready. Well, the, re the, real the reason why we might roll our eyes at stuff like this is because disaster planning seems irrelevant when you're not going through a disaster. It's like, why, why buy fire insurance if my house isn't on fire? Well, that kind of thinking doesn't actually make sense. You actually, you buy car insurance, not planning to get in a car accident, but in the hopes that one day if it happens, that you'll be protected, right? Isn't that the mentality? So car insurance, fire insurance, disaster insurance, earthquake insurance, there's insurance for everything nowadays. Pet insurance, everything insurance. But you're buying this insurance, hoping that it doesn't happen, but it might. You know, it's crazy, we have all these insurances for things that are not guaranteed to happen. But Jesus is saying right here, these things I'm telling you, the rapture, my second coming, these are guaranteed to happen. This absolutely will happen. So why are you preparing more for a fire and not preparing for your eternity? We're preparing for these disaster plans. We're, we're looking at these things as maybe it'll happen, a car accident, maybe it'll happen. And you're preparing for these things, but you know one day you will die and you're still not ready? You know you're gonna die. I know I'm gonna die. One day none of us will be alive. And I hope that one day, that when that day happens, when that time comes, when that hour and that final second of your life ticks, that you will be ready and you will stand before God, saved and set free, not because of your own good works, but because you sat there and said, God, I'm done living on my own. I want to give my life to you. I'm surrendering everything. It's time for me to get ready. Someone say, get ready. Another reason why this is so important Another reason why not knowing the time is important is because we need to be ready now, not later. What do I mean by that? Well, here's the thing. If we remain ready, it, it eliminates this attitude of I have time. Just imagine God said, I'm going to come back. And it's going to be on, see, May 1st at 9 p.m., Right now, it's 8 o'clock, and you're here, and you're watching online. I guarantee you, I guarantee that if God gave us one more hour, some of us, and I'm just going to say, I don't know who, some of us are going to go crazy in sin until that last minute. We're going to say, you know what? I'm going to just go crazy. I'm going to binge everything. I'm going to live for myself. And in that last final second, I'm going to repent, and I'm going to give my life to God. Oh, come on, don't act holy now, all of a sudden. Some of us might think this way. 
Some of us might think I have time. Some of us might think I don't need to prepare. Some of us might think that day or that time is coming. It's 10 years from now, I got time. It's 20 years from now, I got time. It's 100 years from now, I got time. But the reality is you have no idea if you have time right now. How crazy is it to think that you have no idea how much time is left in the hourglass of God's clock? We could be on the last few moments of us being here on this earth. And he can come back in a split second. How scary would that be for those of us that are not ready? This is why God says, stay ready. Be alert at all times. Do not wait to get ready at another time. Don't push this off for the time that you think it'll be. It could happen in a moment. So get ready right now. Someone say, get ready. We got to get ready. We got to be ready. You know, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, stay alert. Someone say, stay alert. It says, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That word up here that says stay alert, see that word alert up there? It's actually the same Greek word that we actually, the, the, the word that we just studied earlier. The one that says stay awake, the one that says keep watch, it's the same exact word. And this word shows up 23 other times in the New Testament. Literally God is telling us this through this word. Stay awake, don't fall asleep. It's gonna come, it will happen, and it will happen when you least expect it. Don't take a vacation from your faith. Don't put God on pause. Don't put your church walk on pause and don't wait for another time. You do not wanna be caught taking a nap when Jesus comes back. I remember when I was younger, I, I used to think that. I used to think, I'm gonna wait till I get older to serve God. And ever, anyone ever thought that like me? I used to think that. I used to think um, I'm going to live how I want to live, and when I get older, I'll serve God. And it will be easier when I get older. That's right. That's funny, right? That's what I thought. I thought I was going to be okay. I thought I'll give my life to God when I'm older. I thought I'll do it later. But the most, one of the most deceiving things we could think is that we even have a later the Bible says that tomorrow is not promised. We don't know the day or the hour. We don't know the time. So I thank God that he had mercy on me and he gave me more time. And he caught my attention while I was a teenager. And I surrendered my life to God. Although I was not perfect and although I still am not perfect, I know this, I've recognized this, that my life apart from God, I'm headed to destruction. But my life with God, I can be free, I can be full of hope, I can be full of peace, I can be set free from addiction. I can have eternal life and forgiveness and all of these things. I can look ahead to a future with God and I don't have to worry about dying in my sin because I know God has forgiven me of my sin. How many are thankful? That's the promise Jesus gives us. What are some ways that we fall asleep? Here are ways that we might fall asleep or we not keep watch. We fall asleep when we compromise to sin. We fall asleep when we have lack of devotion to God. What does that mean? I, I, I ignore God every day. God wants to speak to me. He wants to spend time. I want, and he wants me to spend time in his word and I ignore him. I don't speak to him anymore. My fire goes out. What are some other ways we begin to fall asleep and we begin to, we begin, we put ourselves in a position for the enemy to attack? Another way is no dependence on God. I lose all dependence on God. I begin to depend more on my job than I do with faith in God. I depend more on the drugs for my peace than I do on the Prince of Peace. I depend more on a relationship to feel loved than I do on God who is love. When I depend on anything else other than God, what I'm telling God is God, I've lost interest in you and I've put more interest in someone or something else. Other ways we fall asleep, we begin to backslide, thinking we have time and that I'll repent later. Other ways we fall asleep is we stop telling others about Jesus. We think that they even have time. You do not know if your loved ones have time. 
You do not know if your kids have time. We do not know if our parents have time. Someone right now in this world is probably waiting for you to tell them about Jesus. And we're pushing it off thinking, I'll tell them later because they have time. We don't know. We have no idea. This is why it's so important for us to understand we do not know the time. We have to be ready at all times. Someone say, stay alert. alert. Let's go to point number two. In this scripture, in Matthew 24, verse 45, this point two is this. God rewards those who are ready. It says, a faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. So Jesus is describing two different people in this passage of scripture. He goes on to describe an evil servant. Verse 48 says, but if the servant is evil and thinks my master won't be back for a while, and he begins beating the other servants. That's messed up. He beats the other servants. He's partying and getting drunk. It sounds like 2024, literally. <laughs> Verse 50, he said, the master will return unannounced and unexpected. And he will cut the servant to pieces. And assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is hard. I know this sounds harsh, but God is describing two different people. And he's saying there's two different categories of people. There's two types of people in this time. When Jesus comes back, there won't be three types of people. There won't be 10 different categories of people. All these different categories will will fall short to these two categories. There'll be the one who's ready and there'll be the one who's not ready. That's it. The one who's ready, this is what's going to happen. He says they'll be blessed. The one who's ready will be faithful. They'll be found faithful. It's a trusty person. He shows himself faithful in the execution of commands or the discharge of official duties. That's one way he describes them. Here's my question I have for you. This word faithful basically means you can be relied on. My question to you is this. Are you reliable to God? How do you know you're reliable? Well, when God says do something, we do it. It's called obedience. And obedience comes when God gives us instructions and we carry them out. Obedience is difficult because obedience will challenge your flesh. Your flesh doesn't want to obey. Your flesh doesn't want to say yes to God. You might have better things to do on a Wednesday night, but you showed up in the house of God. You're obedient to God. You showed up in church. You might feel like, man, I wanted to go back to my old sin. I wanted to go back to these things, but you stuck it out. That's obedience. You know that no obedience, there's no obedience that you do for God that will be in vain. Every time you resist your flesh, there's a reward for you. Every time you overcome temptation, God has promises and rewards for you and blessings for you. Every time you say no to the the devil and yes to God, that God has things he's ready to release and impart in you because he finds you faithful and reliable. Listen, I just want to say this. If no one has said this in a long time, I just want to say good job. Good job. You said no to the devil. You said no to his sin. You said no to the addiction. Oh, but I messed up again. I messed up. But you got back up, and you're here in the house of God today, and it's time to say no to the devil again. Just keep getting back up. You made it in the house. God has promises for you. Keep saying yes to God. Keep finding yourself faithful to God. Finding yourself reliable to the Lord. How do you remain reliable? Just obey him. 
When he says move, we move. When he says speak, we speak. When, we, when he says go, go. When he says don't do that no more, we don't do that no more. When, when he says cut that off, we cut that off. As hard as it may be, when you say yes to God, it's the best thing you can ever do in your life. Some people wonder, how do I grow? How do I get to that level? How do I receive the power and the anointing and the fire? How do I preach the word with authority and with power? There's no secret sauce. There's no little hidden gem or little thing. It's just say, just be obedient. Just say yes to God when he says something. And every time you say yes to God, he will find you trustworthy and he will give you a new set of instructions. He'll find you more and more responsible. When we look at people like Pastor Marco, who's done so much in the kingdom of God, and we wonder, how did he get to that level? It's not because he started there. It's because he said yes to God in the little thing. And God says, you're reliable. I can give you one more thing. And he said yes to God again. And he gave him another thing. And he said yes to God yet again. And God has given him more and more. If you want to grow in your walk with God, if you want to do more for the kingdom, if you want God to use you in a fresh and a new way here in 2024 and here in this generation and here in this day and age, then just keep saying yes to God, and he will find you faithful, and will give you more. How many want more from God? How many want more word from God? You want more of God's anointing. You want more revelation in the word. You want more, you, you want more assignments from the Lord. Then just say yes to God. Someone say yes. yes. That was powerful. That was good yes. You guys are ready. Another characteristic, going back to verse 45, he says, a faithful, he says, a faithful and a sensible servant. Verse 45, a faithful and a sensible servant. Sensible, can we pull for, verse 45 up here, please? It says, a faithful and a sensible. Someone say sensible. The word sensible actually means intelligent, it means wise, it means showing care and thought for the future. It's wise to think about the future. It's wise to think about eternity. It's wise to think about where you're going to spend forever and ever and ever. It's wise. It is unwise to just think about this life here and pay no attention to where you're going to end up for all of eternity. It is wise to think about what's going to happen after you die. This is why the Bible says it's better to spend time at funerals than at parties. Because at parties, the mentality is, live it up. Life is short. Some of the worst advice you can ever tell yourself or tell others is you only live once. That's one of the worst things to happen. That's actually, as a matter of fact, I feel like that's such a demonic mentality. You only live once, so just live it up. Go crazy. Live life how you want. Do me. Just do you. This is all part of the enemy's plan to get you to think that you still got time. You know, I heard this quote. It said that the most dangerous, let me find it so that I don't butcher it. It says that the most dangerous attack, the most dangerous lie is not that there is no God. The most dangerous lie is not that there is no hell, but the most dangerous lie of Satan is that there is no hurry. Why hurry? You got time. You're still young. Just live for yourself. That's called being unsensible. It's called being unwise. Have you ever seen those, anyone ever watched those, like, movies those crazy movies where someone's like running away from some crazy killer and they're running through the house and and the person's in the house and you just want to scream at the tv like get out of the house <laughs> and they're they're just they're doing they leave the house but they forgot their favorite blanket or something and they run back in the house i don't know i'm just favorite blanket i don't know they forgot their, you know, their, their mother's necklace that they left them. They run back. And, Murderers in the house. I'm just making this story up. I don't, I don't know. I've never seen this movie, but. And you're like, what are you doing? Get out of the house. It's right there. I behind you. You're, the frustration you feel, you know what I'm talking about? You're like, I'm so done with this person. And then they get killed. And you're like, they deserved it. They deserved it. 
deserved it. What are you doing? I would have been, I would have been so gone. I would have been so, it's crazy. The movie would have been over, scene one. Oh, uh-uh, boom, I'm gone. End of movie, you're gone. Do you ever watch those movies and just feel that way? I think it's crazy. I'm going to just say this. The same thing could be happening to you right now. That all these things that Jesus is talking about, he actually means it. It's going to happen. We will die. We will be taken up. And I wonder if there is someone watching us thinking, just give your life to Jesus. What are you doing? It's time to surrender to God. What are you doing? Let go of your past. What are you doing? Give God your everything. You know that God has eternity for you. The, the secret, it, it, there is no secret. God loves you so much. He can give you a future. He can set you free. He can destroy the enemy all in one moment in your life. And all you have to do is surrender to him. Wake up. Stay alert. Be sensible. I believe God is telling us that tonight. Why are we waiting? Why are we pushing this off? You know, you probably were invited tonight by somebody because they love you. Maybe they've been telling you over and over, it's time to give your life from God, and you're tired of hearing that. But wouldn't you do the same for somebody you love that you knew was headed into destruction? See, all the things that Jesus talks about, they're not lies. They are not fairy tales. They are not un... <laughs> they're not fantasy. This is reality. Everything that the Bible has prophesied about Jesus, it's happened. There is no person in history that has been able to accomplish or do what Jesus has done. And it's all been predicted in scripture that this would happen this way. And then that very person comes to this earth and tells us about the next things to happen. Wouldn't we believe somebody like that? Jesus truly is the son of God. And he's here. And he's telling you tonight, there is not a lot of time. The clock is ticking. We gotta wake up. We gotta surrender our life to God. It's time. Maybe you've put it off. And you know what, here's the thing. There may not be something extra spectacular about this night or extra uh, special about May 1st, 2024. But you wanna know what's special about this night? That you're here and God's speaking to you. That's all that matters. You showed up, you're online, and God is speaking to you. Whoever it is that's hearing this word tonight, and you know who you are, that God has been knocking on your heart's door, and God has been asking you to open up, not to condemn you, not to throw you away, but so that he can give you a new beginning, and he can forgive you. You know all the hurt and pain that's in your heart right now? God, Jesus has gone through all the pain in the world. And I believe he's telling you tonight that I can carry your pain. I can take your sin. I can take your brokenness. And I can give you new life and a new beginning. Tonight is your night to surrender everything to Jesus. The Bible says, it's the truth, that all have sinned. Everyone has fallen short. How many have sinned in here? Good. I'm glad we got no liars in this church here. We're honest people. I see someone put two hands up. He put his foot up. I see. We've messed up. We've all sinned. We're all in the same, we're in the same boat. Me and you. All of us. We're on the same boat. All of us need a savior. How do I know that? Because the Bible says there's a wage, a price for the sin that we've committed. In other words, because we sinned, we owe a big, big debt. It's called death. Death is a price you have to pay for your sin. You want sin? Sure, here you go. The devil changes, uh, gives you sin. 
but also it's going to cost you death. What does that mean? You begin to die now. Your hopes die, your dreams die, your soul dies, your joy, your peace dies. Things begin to deteriorate. And in the inside, you're like an empty shell. You got nothing inside. Full of deeper, to darker depression. Full of more, more uh, just painstaking anxiety. Full of deep, welled up anger. You become worse of a person than you once were. And you know that you're deteriorating on the inside, but it doesn't stop there. Death goes on even after we die in these physical bodies, and it's called hell. The price we owe for our sin is death on here, on this earth, and eternal destruction forever in hell. Okay, so how can I make up for that? Tell you what, from this point on, I'll just be a better person. I'll just start, I'll, I'll just, I'll be better, I'll try and do good, I, I will, I will be, uh, I will do good deeds. How about that? I won't kill anybody. I'll stop stealing. And I'll overall just be a better person. Can't do that. You know that there's no amount of good you can do to make up for even one sin you've committed? You know, when we sin, we actually separate ourselves from God. And it's like, we, we willingly, we, we willingly, what we're doing when, we, when we're in our sin, when we're bound in our sin, we've been, we separate ourselves from God. And we don't know God. Just imagine you went to someone's house. You barged in and you said, hey, I need a room in your house because I'm a good enough person. And that person says, I don't know you though. It's gonna be the same in heaven. If we die in our sin, the Bible, th these are the words that someone will hear. And these are the words that some people that have died in their sin, this is the words they've hear. Depart from me, I never knew you. So where's our hope? If we can't make up for the good we've done, if we can't do, try and be a better person to make up for the wrong we've done, then where's the hope? What do I do? You need a savior. You need someone to save you. It's the only way. When I think about a savior, I don't think about just someone that get, does me a favor. A savior is not someone that just lends a helping hand. A savior is not somebody that does you a solid. Thanks, bro. Thanks, Jesus. I appreciate it. That's not a savior. A savior is when you're bound, you're lost at sea, in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm, you're going to drown and die unless someone comes and rescues you. It's like you're burning in a house. The whole house is on fire. There's no way out. It's going to collapse on your life. And someone comes in and snatches you out of the flames of hell himself. He's burned for you. And you don't have a scratch on you. That's a savior. A savior is someone when you're ready to face your death penalty and someone comes barging in the courtroom and says, Your Honor, I'll face that death penalty on their behalf so that they can live another day. That is a savior. And that's what Jesus has done for you. So how can you get ready tonight? How can you make yourself ready right now? Here's how. Give your life to Jesus Christ, put your faith in him as your savior. Cry out to him, save me, Jesus. I'm bound in my sin. I know I'm headed into destruction. I am not ready. Jesus, I need you, save me. And when you cry out for God to save you, the Bible says everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He will answer you. You mean everyone? I've been addicted to the same drug for 24 years. Even me, even you. I, there's things I've done that, that no one else knows about. I've, I've hurt people. I, I've destroyed people's lives. No one knows about it. God will save someone like me? Yes, even you. 
I've lied, I've cheated, I've stolen, I've backstabbed people. I'm not a good person inside. Will God love someone like me? Yes, even you, even the thief on the cross. You know, Jesus was crucified with two people. There's one person on his right, one person on his left. These were thieves that were being crucified on the cross along with Jesus. And one of those thieves in his last moments said, Jesus, please remember me. He was crying out to his Savior. Even a thief on the cross could get saved. So could you. Tonight could be your night. Give Jesus your heart. I know it feels like I'm pleading with you. It's because I am. I am pleading with you. I don't feel like I'm begging you. I don't care if I look foolish, I look dumb. I, if I could sit here and beg you to give your life to God, I'll do it. I don't care about looking stupid. I don't care about looking dumb. If that means that you can be free, if that means you can have a new beginning, if that means you can be saved, if that means you can be forgiven, if that means you can have a new start, if that means you can be a, a free from addiction and oppression and from the gates of hell and snatched out of the grips of the devil, then I'll do it. I beg you, give your life to Jesus tonight. Surrender to him. He loves you. What you're hearing from me is nothing compared to how much God loves you. If you think God doesn't love you, that's a lie from the devil. If God would give up his only son so that he can have a relationship with you, why do you think he'll hold back his love? He's given it all. I'm going to ask you this. If you want to give your life to Jesus, then would you do that tonight? Will you give your life to him? Tonight's the night. I'm going to count to three. And if you want to give your life to Jesus right here in this room, right here in front of everybody in this room, if you're ready to surrender it all, when I count to three, I want you to just raise your hand. Yes, it'll be in front of people. Because here's the thing, Jesus died for us publicly. And Jesus doesn't want you to be ashamed of him because Jesus was not ashamed of you. Again, we're all in the same boat. There's no shame in admitting you need a savior. The only shame is when you think that you got it yourself. There's no shame in saying, I need Jesus. You know why? Because all of us, including me, at one point had to say, I need you, Jesus. I need you. I was there in your shoes where I had to raise my hand, where I had to give my life to Jesus, and now's the time. When I count to three, if you're ready to receive Jesus, I want you to raise your hands all over this room. One, two, three. You're saying, I want to give my life to Jesus tonight. Look at all those hands. I see you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. I see you. 18, 19, 20, I see you, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, anybody else? You're saying, 39, I see you. Anybody else, you wanna, at 30, 40. Come on, let's give a hand for those that just gave their life. I don't want anybody else to leave. I know we're getting out right now, but let's all stand up. Here's what we're gonna do. If right now you made this decision to give your life to Jesus, I want you to do one more bold thing for me. 40 of you I counted. I want to see all 40 of you do one more thing. Would you give us the honor of congratulating you, of praying with you, and helping you take your next step? Would you come out of your seat and come forward? We have a team up here. We're just gonna, we're gonna shake your hand. We're gonna partner up with you. We're gonna show you what your next step is. If you set, if you raise your hand, come to the front. Come to the front. Come to the front. Come on, let's give a hand, guys. This is where we get excited. Come on, this is the moment. Their family has been praying for them. Their mom has been praying for them. Their dad has been praying for them. Their brothers or sisters have been praying for them. And they're finally here giving their life to Jesus. Wouldn't you celebrate if it was your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad? Let's clap like if this was your family up here. Come on, let's give God some praise.
as they're coming forward. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. Always oh, supporting his family. You can come up, support your family. We're probably going to need another 30, 25 to 30 altar workers, DG leaders. I need your help up here, please. This is awesome. So listen, everybody that just came forward, everyone that just came forward, listen to me for a quick sec. Hang on one second. What we're going to do, everyone that just came forward, we're going to help you in your walk. We're going to show you what your next step is. We're going to help you grow in your walk, okay? Picture this as like the beginning of your new life. When you were born, your mom, your dad, or whoever, auntie, uncle, grandma, they helped you walk, they fed you, they showed you how to crawl, how to walk, how to run. And in the same way, when you become a Christian, you're gonna have to learn how to walk. You're gonna learn how to grow in your walk with God. Learn how to pray, learn how to read your Bible. We're gonna help you get baptized like all those that came up here and that said, I'm all in, I'm all in. We're gonna help you get baptized. So there's a class called Starting at the Way. We're gonna give you 15 days of, of devotional reading. We're gonna pray with you. We're gonna help you get baptized. And this is going to be one of the greatest, today, tonight, it's one of the greatest days in your entire life. Mark this day, May 1st, 2024. You'll never be the same again. So altar workers, listen, I want you to make sure that you sign them up on the app or go to igotsaved.com. Make sure we get everyone's information. We still have some people here in the middle. I need altar workers up here, please. We have people over here as well. I need your help. I want to make sure everybody has somebody. Let's do this. Bow your heads with me. Close your eyes. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for saving me. I cry out to you now. I confess that I've sinned against you. I know that without you, I have no hope. So right now, I declare that my faith is in you, Jesus. I give you my life. From this moment forward, I'll never be the same. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the dead so that I can be saved. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Fill me now with your spirit. Make me a new creation. I am born again. I am saved. And I'm on my way to heaven with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Come on, church, let's give God one more shout of praise tonight.